Uh, good morning. Thank you very much to Lou Pardo for your sponsorship. I can tell you, I, I know full well that without sponsors, these kinds of events don't happen. So we need to always make sure that we acknowledge the sponsors. Uh, my mission today is to uh, uh, engage in a conversation with uh, some of the leaders from our region as it relates to understanding what it means to be sustainable and what it means to create a leadership process that allows us to understand where it is we're trying to go and what it is we're trying to do to get there. I, the, the word sustainability, a, a good friend of mine, Phil Powers, says I always have trouble with words that have more than two syllables. And, and I agree with Phil uh, to a degree because we need to take sustainability and we need to turn it into something that people can understand, uh, something that people can live and learn and use every day. And, and my congratulations to Mayor Dixon for what you've done in Greensburg, Kansas. Um, I think you've taken some very difficult issues and converted it into concrete examples of how we can change the way we live and how we work and play. I wake up every morning, as most of you have heard me give these speeches, uh, thinking about what I'm going to do to make sure that this is a best place to live, work, learn, and play. I don't lack for things to do. I don't lack for things to think about. Uh, and I see many faces out there, people that have interfaced with us uh, during the journey that we've been taking at the West Michigan Strategic Alliance. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Uh, and I was trying to figure out today whether this was going to be kind of up uh, speech or down speech uh, as we relate to getting into the subject matter that we'll talk about. And I, I find myself sometimes falling into the down speeches because we do have significant crisis that we're faced with. 15 plus percent unemployment in Michigan. Uh, foreclosures exceeding 30 percent. I can go on and on with, with the sets of issues that we face with. But as, as was suggested, uh, these kinds of things really create options for us as it relates to opportunities. Uh, and as, as one of my board members said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And in this case, uh, we shouldn't waste the current crisis. Uh, but what we should do is use the crisis to create a sense of urgency uh, about what we need to do. Uh, fortunately, we're, we haven't gotten blown away by a tornado. Uh, and so we don't have to start from a clean sheet of paper. Uh, but we do have to move from just achieving incremental change to achieving substantial structural change. Uh, easy for me to talk about. And as I talk about collaboration, I always say it's a really easy thing to talk about, difficult thing to do. Because your collaboration is my requirements to meet the needs of my constituencies. And sometimes those constituencies don't always align. Uh, and so what we need to do here in West Michigan is figure out how to take our crisis because we are in a crisis, and convert it into opportunities for us to make sure that West Michigan is a place, a, a best place to live, work, learn, and play. Um, a lot of my work and a lot of my thinking comes from uh, a guy by the name of Mark, Michael Porter out of Harvard. And Michael talks about the four Ps of marketing. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, we talk about place. Uh, in this case, the place is West Michigan. We talk about promotion. What is it we do in West Michigan, and what do we do well? And how can we talk about it in a way that makes good sense for us? We talk about price. What's the cost to do business here? What's the cost of operating uh, our various entities? And how well do we do that in a competitive marketplace? And most importantly, we have a product. The product is the triple bottom line. The product is our economy, the product is our environment, the product, product is our social responsibility, and how we integrate those three things to create the product we call West Michigan will define whether or not we'll be successful uh, in the global marketplace that we, we deal with today. And if you don't think we're global, <laughs> and if you don't think we have to think globally, uh, then you really need to have a further chat with me and we'll do that offline some other time. <laughs> and that's the serious part of my discussion. The 15 percent unemployment won't come back unless we figure out how to become intellectually capable to deal in a competitive marketplace. Unless we can figure out how to educate people to the extent that we have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, technical degrees that allow our marketplace to offer opportunities for employers to say this is the right place to be. I'll tell you the best anecdotal example of, of a company making a decision to go where there's talent was Detroit. 
Most people don't think of Detroit as a place to do investments, but General Electric just put a new R&D facility there. And the reason they went there is there's a thousand plus engineers looking for employment. And most of those people, uh, probably to the to Mayor Dixon's point, d really don't want to leave Southeast Michigan. And as long as there's employment there, they'd be happy to stay. I can tell you they're all upside down in their houses because of the uh, market value. Um, and GE saw an opportunity to tap a lot of very smart people to deal with the issues that they're faced with in their marketplace. And so uh, to the extent that we can understand those kinds of issues uh, will help us to be successful. Uh, at the Alliance, uh, when I took over, most of you know this, um, one of my issues was, well, how do I know that tomorrow will be better than yesterday? Uh, and I asked the same question to my colleagues over here on the panel. We'll talk about this a little bit. How do you know that Grand Rapids is a better city than it was yesterday, or the city of Holland, or Muskegon County, or the ways that we measure ourselves in terms of our performance? Because triple bottom line is about performance. Triple bottom line is about understanding what the, what the measurements are telling you about how well you're competing. And in our case, we look at what we call the vital signs. And if you haven't been to our website, I'd encourage you to go see the vital signs. We look at our economic performance, we look at our environmental performance, and we look at our social performance. This year, we introduced benchmarking. We looked at ourselves against 26 other regions of the country to qualify as an apples to apples comparison. You had to have five or more counties, you had to have two or more metropolitan areas, you had to have a population base exceeding 300,000, not to exceed 2 million. And we compare ourselves now to cities like Austin and Portland, Raleigh. And if you look at that, in some cases, we don't do very well. But we say we're a best place to live, work, learn, and play. Well, guess what? To be a best place to live, work, and play, you've got to understand what your competition is and what you're doing to be competitive in the marketplace. And we've got some things to work on. On the other hand, we've got some great foundations. Uh, and that's what our panel is going to talk about uh, this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, have on the panel Mayor Hartwell. And, and without doing the bio, um, I have to tell you that the mayor is one of those people in our region that really does understand what it means to be green. He's even got a green tie on, I noticed today. <laughs> How appropriate. Um, but I'll tell you, it's the mayor's leadership that has helped the city of Grand Rapids understand what it means to be sustainable and what the commitment to sustainability means and how do you convert green into an effective development process. Because green is not only green in terms of the environment, green can be green in terms of revenues coming into the city. Or green can be revenues being invested in new projects because it's the right place to be. Uh, and he doesn't need much further ex introduction than that other than the work that they've done uh, here in Grand Rapids. Uh, I'm also pleased to have Mayor Al McGeehan, call him Mayor Al. It was okay for George Bush to call Mayor Al, and so Al has told me that it's okay for me to call Mayor Al as well. Um, I've known the mayor ever since I've, I came to West Michigan, another one of those kind of leading lights, another one of those people with a willingness to talk about how to achieve collaboration. And I'll tell you, for us as a region, Sustainability is easy to talk about. As I mentioned earlier, it's the collaborations that we need to create across Grand Rapids, across Holland, across Muskegon, uh, because our region is what will define our success. And I can tell you that Mayor McGeehan, Mayor Al, has been one of the stronger promoters of the regional thought process. And so I, he's a good friend of mine uh, for those reasons and for the good work that they've done in Holland that I'll let him talk about. Lastly, we're fortunate to have uh, Commissioner John Snyder with us. Uh, commissioner in Muskegon County. Uh, it's not really a mayor's panel. It's a region panel made up of representatives that bring different governmental thought processes to our region. I'll tell you, one of the things they're doing in Muskegon that I was very encouraged by is five communities came together to create the Muskegon Area Plan, a demonstration about how local units of government could figure out how to work together and plan together uh, to achieve and improve results. And we need to have more ways to encourage our local governmental units to figure out how to work together. And while we think about it, it's important to protect the assets and the commitment to our local units of government, we also need to help our local unit of government uh, understand that it's okay to work together. That we should have partnerships that allow us to partner with our neighbor next door to make sure that there's no dividing line 
Because those of us that drive back and forth to work every day don't see those lines. Those of us that go out and socialize together don't see the lines. Those of us that go to church don't see those lines. And for all the other kinds of things that we do in our region, we don't see the lines. What we need to see is we need to see partnerships that help us become stronger as a region uh, and thus able to play. Uh, the way the panel is set up is I've asked uh, each of them to uh, do about 10 minutes of what, what they think is important uh, in terms of the challenges and the kinds of things that they've done to ensure sustainability in their county or their cities. Uh, I've got three questions that we'll ask of them once we finish with those, uh, those presentations. And then if there's time, uh, obviously we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, and we didn't flip a coin to see who would start, but I think I'll start with uh, Mayor Hartwell uh, as part of this process. And that's what we're all about for about the next uh, 50 minutes. Mayor Hartwell. Okay, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and as I hinted in my uh, opening remarks, uh, I think what I'd like to do with, with this 10 minutes is, is give you a, a bit of a snapshot of the triple bottom line in Grand Rapids. Uh, uh, and, and focus at least initially on successes um, and, and then, and then uh, time permitting talk about some of those challenges as you suggested, uh, Greg. Um, uh, balancing the triple bottom line is important to us here, but let me start with green uh, and, and green initiatives that, uh, that, that where we've had success. In 2005, uh, we set a goal of 20% uh, renewable energy by uh, 2000. Uh, eight. Uh, we achieved that goal and uh, um, full of myself, I, I stood up uh, at a State of the City address and said there's no reason why we can't uh, uh, achieve a 100% goal, municipal power uh, demand from renewable energy by the year 2020. We're, we're on our way uh, to, uh, to achieving, on that journey uh, to, toward achieving that, um, that goal. Um, all of our city fleet uh, operates on alternative fuels uh, uh, for at least uh, eight months out of the year. Um, uh, we're, still, we're still not using, during the cold winter months, uh, we're still not using, it's not me, I don't think. Uh, we're still not using uh, 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 biodiesel fuels. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but so, so uh, alternative fuels is an important part of, of our sustainability initiative. Uh, um, uh, energy conservation, uh, uh, clearly the quickest and simplest uh, and, 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 and highest impact way to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, a reduction in your, in your uh, uh, electrical power costs as well as a reduction in the, in the carbon output. And, and uh, so we have been engaged in renewable uh, or, or in uh, uh, energy efficiency measures. In fact, um, because the 20% green power is costing us uh, more than, than uh, the, the balance of our power, uh, we, f we financed that cost in effect or funded that cost uh, through some efficiencies uh, in, in changing out uh, pumps in our Lake Michigan uh, water filtration plant uh, pumping that water uh, for, this, for the city of Grand Rapids and surrounding communities 32 miles uh, inland uh, for some energy efficient pumps and, and, the, and sort of captured the savings in power costs and directed that to, uh, uh, to, to energy, green energy purchases. Um, our river, uh, I, I mentioned the, the lovely river walk that we have in my opening remarks this morning. Uh, uh, a, a decade and a half ago, uh, you wouldn't have enjoyed that walk uh, as much as you would today. Uh, uh, the river was a dump, and uh, in fact, in our in our worst year, uh, 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 to our shame, uh, we contributed. The city of Grand Rapids contributed 12 billion gallons of raw or partially treated sewage to the Grand River that flows out to Lake Michigan, from which we pull our drinking water. Um, we set about, a, with, uh, with, with encouragement from the EPA, uh, we set about an, on, a, on an aggressive plan to, uh, to, to turn that around. And, and we're pleased to say that, uh, that, the, that while we, we're not done with the job yet, um, the um, discharge uh, into the Grand River uh, for the year 2008 was uh, four-tenths of one percent of 
the, uh, of, the, of our worst year, our 12 billion gallon year. So we're well on our way uh, at, with a tremendous investment uh, by, the, by the citizens of Grand Rapids. Uh, not a lot of help from federal and state government. Uh, it's been local investment. Uh, right now to the tune of about $1,100 per man, woman, and child uh, in the city of Grand Rapids. So uh, uh, not, not an inconsequential amount. And then one other thing that I want to uh, highlight under green this morning because it's, it's fresh and new for us and, uh, and, and not truly ready for announcement yet, but uh, yesterday uh, the City of Grand Rapids submitted a, a, a grant application uh, to the uh, environmental U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, for, um, is somebody working on that, Greg? Yeah, yeah good, good. Uh, <laughs> It's getting irritating, isn't it? <laughs> we submitted a grant application to the, uh, the uh, US EPA for a, uh, uh, for a carbon uh, reduction plan uh, for, our, for our Grand Rapids uh, region. Um, it will be a, a, a carbon offset uh, program uh, that uh, uh, will engage uh, industry uh, uh, for, and as well as as well as individual residents and, and, and homeowners uh, uh, and business owners uh, throughout, throughout our area. The, the, the partners on this are the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Right Place uh, Incorporated, which is our uh, regional economic development uh, outreach organization, Grand Valley State University, uh, our Convention Visitors Bureau, uh, and the City of Grand Rapids, of course, and, the, and our private sector partner, uh, Viability uh, Inc. Please uh, stop and see their exhibition out here and one of the screens that they have up this morning is on our uh, VIA CAP program uh, that was uh, again submitted for funding uh, just yesterday. Um, because, uh, because we believe so firmly in triple bottom line, let me, let me point out that uh, uh, a couple of things quickly in um, uh, social equity, uh, the Grand Rapids Public Schools is a challenged district like any urban district in the, in the nation today and uh, for the past six years we've had, a, we've had a concerted effort between the city and our public schools to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, improve the quality of education for their children. Uh, uh, we are just able to announce that uh, 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 collective grants over the course of the past four years totaling $44 million uh, that were uh, applied for jointly by the city and the Grand Rapids Public Schools have resulted in a, an after school programming in every, in every school building, uh, K through middle school uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Grand Rapids Public School District. Uh, a second uh, a social equity initiative that has clear triple bottom line implications is a childhood lead poisoning program that uh, 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 it, came out of our recognition that in one discrete neighborhood of Grand Rapids with uh, over, uh, 900, uh, over 960 uh, residences, 46% uh, of the children uh, under the age of six living in that neighborhood who were tested for lead, tested at medical intervention levels. Half the kids in that neighborhood tested at medical intervention levels for lead. Um, and so we launched a, a collaborative effort with uh, uh, private sector, for-profit, non-profit partners, hospitals, clinics, uh, city and county government working together uh, to address that problem. And then finally, let me touch on the third uh, element of, uh, of the triple bottom line, uh, uh, economic uh, viability. Um, Grand Rapids uh, uh, can't certainly escape the, the fact that we're a Michigan city, and so Michigan's economy deeply impacts the, uh, the, the city of Grand Rapids. We are. One of the uh, core communities uh, in the state of Michigan that is probably doing best economically, uh, and, and yet still we have, uh, we have double digit unemployment here in Grand Rapids. Uh, um, we're focusing on growth in, uh, and, and, and directing uh, municipal resources as well as community resources uh, toward building the, uh, the capacity for health care and uh, medical research uh, with our Van Andel uh, Research Institute, uh, uh, the University of uh, Michigan State University has moved their entire, sorry Lansing, uh, moved their entire medical school to, uh, to Grand Rapids, uh, uh, construction uh, to be completed next fall and they're 
on their buildings so that they can have a, a full operation here. And then hospital development throughout the area. And, and then clearly uh, 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 higher education has become an important element, not just of the quality of life in, in our community, but the, um, but the economic uh, development of our community. Uh, there are over 6,000 employees of higher education who come downtown Grand Rapids to work uh, every day. Uh, 13 colleges and universities in our metro area, uh, a very, very important part of our uh, local economy. Um, and, and, uh, and a third focus that has been on um, renewable energy and uh, building on some of the state efforts to uh, attract uh, renewable energy manufacturers, uh, uh, whether that's uh, or developers uh, to to this area, uh, a, a key announcement that was made about a month and a half or two months ago uh, was that uh, the um, uh, Spanish uh, uh, logistics wind uh, development logistics uh, company uh, um, Verhe is uh, is coming to uh, uh, and, and is and is here in in, in uh, the Metro Grand Rapids area now working on wind power development up and down the, the, uh, the coast and around the, the state of Michigan. So in a nutshell, uh, that, those are some of the, some of the successes. Uh, have I exceeded my time limit yet? You're fine. Uh, let me take uh, just a minute or two to talk about uh, challenges then. Um, like like uh, any uh, city government in the state of Michigan and most city governments throughout the country, uh, we, we struggle with, uh, with budget challenges. Uh, this city has uh, uh, now has nine consecutive budget cycles uh, where we have solved for deficits with only very modest increases in, in fee revenues, uh, but uh, uh, no, no increase in, in taxes. That means that we're constantly uh, not only looking for efficiencies and, and implementing efficiencies, uh, but we're also having to cut programs and, and reduce or even eliminate uh, some municipal services. Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing for me is that I found that in the midst of that, which can be a, a real downer uh, uh, for, for certainly for people in local government and employees of local government, but also for a community, um, it has been our efforts to at sustainability that have provided the, the vision, the excitement uh, uh, for this community to rally around something in these hard times that we can do and we can show, we can measure and show successes uh, today. Uh, in, in, in spite of the economy. That gives people a, a, a sense of connectedness to the community, uh, engagement in the community, and I think it's very clear uh, to me that with, uh, and, and it's only been within the last 18 months to two years, uh, that Grand Rapids has gone over a, a, a tipping point, a uh, Malcolm Gladwell tipping point, where a, a, a large enough percentage of our population understands the importance of these things um, that that uh, it is uh, that there is irreversible activity uh, uh, around sustainability. Let me stop there. Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, maybe uh, we'll go with John next, and I, and I should add, uh, John's of council, uh, and I, when I read his bio, I said so, so. Of council means must mean retired former attorney with Warner Norcross. We're happy to have John here from Muskegon. I think what's of interest. Uh, the Mayor Hartwell talked about what has been done with regard to the Grand River and the, and the ultimate impact to our friends over in, in the Lakeshore area. Uh, the same kind of thing, John, I think has been uh, dealt with in Muskegon, and, and I know the people in Muskegon are very proud of what's happened with Lake Muskegon, and maybe you can touch on that, because I think watersheds are one of those things that, that truly are regional infrastructure assets, and it's truly one of those things where we should be working together even much more closely than we are today, but we've got some really great examples to build up. So that with that, I'll introduce John Snyder. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, Mayor Hartwell gave me a, a very good segue into what I want to talk about initially is the challenges that I think we face in Muskegon County. And those challenges are basically on the educational front. Uh, the educational difficulties in our schools, the fact that we have a multiplicity of uh, school districts in our county, and the fact also that uh, between our communities, we don't really have the ability to get the message of sustainability and the triple bottom line out to all of the people involved in the community and in community government. We've made some changes, we've made some progress in that regard, and I think we have some successes that I'd like to address. 
first of all, many years ago, a group of people in Muskegon had the foresight to establish a wastewater system that is probably the premier system in the United States. It is operated by the county and it is participated in by all of the municipalities as well as private industry. It is an effective, an effective way of waste disposal. However, it presents its challenges because it is based upon a continuous flow. And that continuous flow was geared to the number of people engaged in industry who could provide the flow. Suddenly that flow is not there. It's sufficient to keep it operating, but with other losses, we will wind up having some difficult problems. That is probably the most sustainable area to which I can uh, indicate Muskegon has been involved. It's a very effective system, and I think it might very well offer some opportunities for Grand Rapids, particularly in your northeast quadrant, or northwest quadrant, uh, to be able to utilize it. It's uh, 14,000 acres, roughly, in the eastern part of our county. Uh, the waste is uh, shipped there uh, by pipeline. It winds up getting treated. It winds up getting sprayed on the uh, ground. We are a large agricultural community. We raise a lot of corn on that, a lot of soybeans that's used for fodder. And the water that goes back into Lake Michigan is potable. <coughs> I'm not sure that I care to drink it, but it is potable. <laughs> In addition, one of the other things that I think we as a county face is the ability to try to get communities to participate with one another to a greater degree. And while we have some public, public partnerships, I think we need to encourage more and more of those. And there is a move afoot, at least on the county's part, to try to get communication, increased communication, among the five cities that make up our core. We don't have just one core city. We have five cities making up our core, and that presents a little bit of a difficulty. It might be very nice to have a metropolitan police force, for instance. However, that takes education, and it takes the ability of people to set aside the barriers that have been created over the years through those lines that you talked about, Greg, that must disappear if we're going to be in a position to be able to really effectively serve the communities totally and equally. And that's a social justice issue as much as anything else. Prosperity, we are in a position where we probably, uh, if Detroit and Southeast Michigan is leading in unemployment, we're not too very far behind. Uh, the rate in the state, as I understand it, is 15.5%. I would guess that uh, we're approaching an area of uh, 19 to 21 percent. Now that's just a guess. I don't know the hard statistics. But it is a difficult economy. However, there are some moves afoot. Private industry is looking at the possibility of green energy. Uh, we have, as a county, entered into some partnerships with private industry to start producing biofuel from algae in our wastewater system. There is a partnership with Western Michigan University as well, and Western Michigan University is going to be using our wastewater system under a lease arrangement to also do some experimentation to see if there are biofuels that can be uh, generated at our wastewater system. We had a former wastewater system in the northern area, and our board chairman is here. That area of Whitehall Montague uh, was a wastewater site. That we have now sold to a private enterprise. And that private enterprise, in conjunction with a, another individual in Muskegon, is going to put together a totally enclosed system that will include not only biofuel, but methane and a number of other private partnership relationships that will produce green energy for in a totally enclosed system without any loss of energy, which is a very interesting concept and a very new concept, very experimental concept. But I'm going to go back to our wastewater system. Uh, we haven't been sitting just disposing of waste. All of our wastewater system is also our w uh, solid waste disposal site. 
Several years ago, the county, in conjunction with private industry, capped one of those cells, inserted gas pipes in it, and is generating methane that is being transported to two industries in the area. That generates revenue for the county, eliminates the methane that's going up, and at the same time provides a very viable and reasonable cost for, uh, item for an industry that is capable of using that type of methane for its electrical production and for its heating production. In addition, uh, the largest lake in uh, Muskegon County, in addition to being Muskegon Lake, which is natural, is our wastewater lagoon system. We're imposing the possibility of putting up some wind turbines that would generate sufficient electricity to be able to service that entire facility, which use, is a tremendous consumer of electricity. I think we have <coughs> made some real progress in establishing not only public and private partnerships, but public to public partnerships. And I'm also suggesting that we have looked outside of our particular realm in the area of sustainability to try to provide regional work and regional substance to the things that we do. I know this is not something that Al wants to talk about, but we have a, a regional basis for uh, drug interdiction. It's a combination, it's a partnership between Ottawa County, Muskegon County, and Allegan County, and several of the individual cities in those that provide for interdiction of drugs. That's a regional partnership that is effective. There is another regional partnership that's effective, and that's the Lakeshore Coordinating Council, which provides substance abuse services for those who weren't interdicted. <laughs> and that <laughs> arrangement also is very effective and moves ahead very, very well. Part of the problem, and Al may well address this later, is the fact that there is difficulty in sorting out how you pay for all of this. And that's the problem that we have, and that's the educational that we also, education that we need to address. Greg, how are we, how, okay. Having said that, I think it's important that we address the fact that constantly, in order to make sustainability and the triple bottom line effective, we need to have greater cooperation, collaboration, and, I hate to say it, consolidation in many instances of governmental units to eliminate those barriers that keep us from accomplishing what I think could be done in our area. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not popular, but as a practical matter, I think it is something that we need to address, and I think it's something that the West Michigan Strategic Alliance started to address way back when it was initiated. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll let Mayor Al respond. Very good. Thank you very much, John. Um, great remarks, and uh, thanks again for being with us this morning. Mayor Al, what's going on in Holland? Well, first of all, I'm ready to hug this guy right here in front of this large audience. Good for you and good for us. What a courageous comment you just ended your presentation with. Hoda Morgen. Well, that's Dutch for good morning, and that just woke up some of the crowd, I think. About 25 miles west of where we're sitting right now is a city of 35,000 folks called Holland, Michigan. There are, however, about 115,000 people who call Holland, Michigan home. Of course, the additional ones live outside of the city limits in many of the townships that surround the city. But if your image of Holland, Michigan is a place that's only wooden shoes and windmills, and maybe Heineken, just as often as you might hear a Huda Morga in front of a coffee shop this time of the day, <laughs> these days you probably hear a Buenos Dias, Buongiorno, Guten Morgen. Holland is a changing city and a changed and will continue to change community, and I'm very glad of that. In our city and in our community, every February, when the skies are gray, 
and the snow has gone from pristine white to ugly charcoal, we watch for the little green tips of tulips that begin to emerge through the snow. We know with those tulips there's going to be new life. There will be an end to the gray skies and gloomy days of winter. And Mayor Bob, I have to think that that's exactly what you were trying to portray in your awesome presentation to us about a renewed spirit of hope in your city. Good for you and good for us. And we all much appreciated your, your topic of conversation. Four weeks ago, the city of Holland and our greater community experienced over $40 million worth of damage to the public and private sector. That's nothing compared to what you good folks have had to face. But I will admit, when you showed us an image of the FEMA circus tent, I can only imagine what Will Rogers, that famous Oklahoman, would say about Washington, D.C. clowns designing and delivering a circus tent to Greensburg. <laughs> I didn't say that. Will Rogers must have said that. But one thing I have said in the past, and Mayor George, you've heard me tell this very quick story. Two years ago, in August of 2007, my wife and I went out to the Gerald R. Ford International Airport. We checked our luggage, and we got our seats and sat down as we were going to enjoy a vacation in Europe. And as I settled into my seat, I reached into that you know, seat pocket of the seat in front of me, and I was rummaging through there, and I found the Northwest Airlines in-flight magazine. And as I flipped through the pages, and I always go from the back to the front, I don't know why, I came upon an article with a headline, which city is leading America in green? And the first paragraph went on to explain how the reader might think it's Las Vegas, Nevada, because Las Vegas has done some awesome things. And the next paragraph talked about Chicago, the next site of this conference. And Chicago also has done remarkable things. I don't think the authors heard your story. But the third paragraph went on to say, no, it's none of those. If you want to go to a region and a city that is leading America in the area of green and sustainability, you need to go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you need to visit West Michigan. Did anybody else see that article? I know Mayor George has it on his desk or it's framed on his wall right now. <laughs> Mayor George Hartwell has been a voice of reason and a voice of vision for not only his city, his region, his state, but his country on the whole issue of sustainability. And George, we all thank you for that. Because he doesn't have to do that. He's got enough other issues. But I'm here to say to the mayor of Grand Rapids mm -hmm. and John from Muskegon County that um, we may a little, be a little bit smaller over there along the lake shore, this town called Holland, but I'm extremely proud of what we have been able to accomplish long before the word sustainability became a, a very often used word in our conversation. What we've been able to do before and what we have been able to do since and what it is yet we still hope to accomplish from both the public as well as the private sector. Because I think our story is worth telling as well. First and foremost, would you agree that the word sustainability probably has more definitions uh, in, in Webster's Dictionary than any other word? I mean, so, churches use it, families use it, businesses use it, government uses it, recreation programs use it. We all use it. I'm sure the media does too. It is so many things. There are some folks who think sustainability and green is only the topic of electric generation, how it's produced, how it's delivered, and, and, and in what quantities. And I would suggest that I'm here to say that the word sustainability, in my mind, has the most broad of definitions, and I think that has been certainly shown in the comments made by both of my colleagues here on this panel already, because you haven't focused on just electric generation or electric gen generation. You have talked about a wide range of legitimate concerns for our communities and for our state. Talking about utilities, however, Holland 
owns its own utilities. Our own electric generation, we either own and built and operate it solely, or we have bought into other uh, public and private electric generation facilities. We also own our own water and wastewater, which allows us to be, unlike some other communities, we can really be masters of our own <coughs> destiny. We are either blessed or cursed, take your pick, we have an electric generating facility within three quarters of a mile of our downtown. Got the image? Could be terrible. On the other hand, because we have an electric generation plant that close to our downtown, when that white stuff does come during the winter months, back in 1988, we tore up our downtown Main Street corridor and we decided it probably wasn't the most environmentally smart thing to be pumping hot water into our inland lake that flows into Lake Michigan, Lake Makatawa, but to be pumping that in there year round, particularly in the winter, it had an environmental impact, we know. So we designed and built America's first snowmelt system, which runs the hot water so that it can heat the streets, heat the sidewalks, some of our downtown parking. It can heat all that, and by the time it winds up going back into the lake, it's a much more reasonable temperature to have less impact on uh, the lake. Now imagine what that does for the use of gasoline for snow plows. Because Steve, when you park and you're heading into your office every morning, you're not climbing over snow piles. You don't have to uh, pay somebody to come out and shovel. It's a wonderful amenity that we have in our downtown. And our downtown, I am here to tell you, I feel it's second to none of a community our size and a lot of cities larger than a place called Holland, Michigan. Living and thinking and working downtown, recreating downtown, if that's not green, I don't know what is. We also, of course, have our own water facility, and there's been some comments about that. We have our own filtration plant, but while we suck water out of the lake for human consumption and manufacturing. We're also extremely aware about the sensitivity we must have toward the condition of our total watershed. Nine units of government surrounding Holland are all part of an MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, formed first and foremost to deal with transportation issues and transportation dollars, but also to deal with the whole issue of the condition, the health of our watershed. And I think we have a couple of representatives from our MAC here today. <clears throat> what are we doing with regard to new initiatives, green initiatives with regard to power? Well, one thing we know for sure, everybody needs more power. Where we get that power, that's something that we all need to talk about. We do have a coal-fired plant in the city of Holland today. We do have three freestanding combustion turbine units that can be fired up on oil or natural gas. We're the only city in the entire state that owns its own natural gas pipeline, as a matter of fact. But what we are currently doing is we have test sites up, three different test, two different test sites in the city to see if it's feasible to put wind turbine inside our city limits. We also have two MET towers up in the UP to determine, and we'll know by the end of this summer, if the analysis shows that we can build as many as 22 electric turbines on a site on the eastern upper peninsula, which is only a half a mile from a major distribution line, if you don't have the distribution line, you might as well not be producing the electric power. But we are serious, serious about reaching ahead, looking forward, and producing less and less from standard, uh, by standard means and standard technologies and we're much more interested in new electrical power coming from a number of different areas. Yes, from wind, if that's feasible. Yes, from bio, if that's possible. And also, Holland, Michigan is one of two cities in the entire country which today has an application before the Federal Department of Energy to determine whether or not Holland or Jamestown, New York will become a site for a scientific test, a test called carbon sequestration. I can't begin to explain it all. I'm a right brain social studies guy by college training. 
but it seems to me that if there is a technology that could be shown that could help us produce electric by clean coal processes, Al, there is no such thing. Haven't you seen that commercial on TV? Well, coal isn't the problem. Carbon is the problem, right? If we can find a way to remove carbon from what's going out that stack, I think that's a test that should be made. And therefore, I know there's been some controversy about that in our city and even regionally, but I'm hoping that Holland will be named as one of the two test sites so that we can discover if carbon sequestration is something smart for new state policy and national policy. By the way, I keep talking about the government because I'm from government. But I can tell you this, folks, when it comes to thinking green and sustainability, the private sector is miles ahead of us and they always have been. Holland, Michigan today is the site of the largest manufacturing office facility that is LEED certified, and that's the Hayworth Corporation building on the south side of town. We have just opened two years ago a new LEED Gold certified downtown hotel. We, just north of Holland in Spring Lake, is the largest producer of green roof materials of anywhere in the United States. And Holland is home to one of the LEED architectural firms known for their sensitivity toward LEED and green design and construction. Do I have another hour? <laughs> I see the clock already says 11 o'clock. But if I say nothing else today, and I'd like to talk more about power and more than what we've been doing, I just want to pull out this brochure. And if you have it, I want you to look at it with me, will you please? I want you to look at the image. I don't know who chose that image, but I want to congratulate them for putting this image of a young man, all right, be politically correct, could have been a young woman there too, but a young person on this cover looking up, just contemplating and wondering. Folks, you've heard it up here already today. I just want to pound my open palm a couple of times on this chair to say the following. We will never achieve sustainability in our communities or in our cities in this state unless and until we have graduates from our educational systems who are able to compete with the best and brightest around this world. We have got to increase high school graduation rates in Holland and in Grand Rapids. And when they're done with high school, our graduates have got to understand that this old mantra of K-12 education, which became pre-K-12 education, has now got to be at least pre K-14 education, and if not, even more. Our students are not being prepared to compete with the rest of the world as they need to be. I'm embarrassed about that. I'm passionate about it. We have got to, George, how many institutions of education? 13. 13 in Grand Rapids. We have got four institutions of higher learning inside the city limits of the city of Holland, and we have just recently added a component from Grand Rapids Community College, whom we know have a fiduciary responsibility to the people of Kent County. But that is still yet not enough. What did I do in my past career? I was a teacher. I was a high school teacher. I was proud of it, and I used to tell my kids, graduate from high school, get a diploma, go out and sell yourself to a company. A company will then hire you, they'll take care of you, they'll pay you a decent wage, you'll get fringe benefits, and when you retire, they'll even give you benefits long after you retire. And you know why I taught history? Because that story is ancient history. We have got to have educational facilities that prepare our students for their first job, their third job, their fifth career, and we're not measuring up as a state. Lou Glazer said it best much better than I, when he said Michigan will either get a lot younger and a lot smarter, or will get a lot poorer. Hold that thought. Good, thank you, Mary Al. Uh, I'm gonna change the format. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, I think it's more appropriate that we take a couple questions from the audience, so uh, with the time that we have, do you have questions? Here we go.
So I, I think for those of you who couldn't hear the question, the Youth Commission made a series of recommendations to talk about how do we deal with educational issues. Mayor Hartwell, I'd like uh, to talk about it. Thanks. Uh, it, it, uh, a great question and a confounding problem uh, 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 everywhere, at least in this country. Um, is, is how to better engage those, those parents uh, in, in the lives of their, of their kids. Um, some of the after school programming in Grand Rapids uh, seeks to reach out to the parents and engage them with their, with their children uh, in after school programming. The, uh, um, uh, Corky, I'm sorry, but help me with the, the name of the program in the Burton Heights area. The Hands of Hope uh, uh, program uh, which is, which is uh, being, uh, has really come out of the work of our Community Sustainability Partnership, uh, uh, is, is engaging families uh, in the homes, in the neighborhoods, working together, working with their kids, uh, and, and I think is a, is a good model, although it's, it's just in its infancy. The problem is enormous, as, as was clear through the, uh, through the interview. The kids want that parental engagement. That was the other stunning piece of that. You know, they want their parents involved in their lives. Uh, uh, teens, uh, uh, mine didn't, but uh, <laughs> that just shows you how much things have changed. And, and, uh, and, 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 and I think we got a lot of work to do in that regard. Yeah. Mayor Al? Mayor Bob said faith, family, and friends, and we have used the line in Holland many, many times because it's absolutely right. Holland, Michigan, for years was known as, oh, that's that town with a church in every corner? And we still have a lot of churches on every corner doing a lot of good work. But to your point, last year almost 40% of the children born in Holland Hospital were born to single parents. P.S. I didn't just say to single women. They're born to single parents and as long as that is the reality or that number continues to increase, we will never find sustainability with that kind of reality. That's a challenge for all of us folks. I couldn't agree more because one of the things that we face in Muskegon is that figure is closer to 55 percent. Wow. Good. Other questions? Yep, right here. About the, the lead issue. Okay, thank you. Um, what, what kind of spurred you to investigate the issue? What was the problem? Did you target was it the paint, the toys, what was the source, and then how did you mitigate? And also, have you taken any measurements after that? Um, taking a look at non toxic building materials or. Um, so the question was is basically is what spurred the city of Grand Rapids to look at the lead issue and what did you do about it? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, there, there was a, a, a meeting between uh, the county health department uh, and a group of environmental organizations uh, led by the West Michigan Environmental Action Council uh, along with uh, a representatives of what was, uh, is called here the Summit on Racism uh, to look at lead poisoning as an, as an issue of environmental racism. Uh, and out of that work, uh, we began to forge a coalition uh, which, is, which is called, uh, cleverly, uh, Get the Lead Out, uh, that included, uh, it included the area hospitals and clinics, uh, medical providers, uh, both, the, both the County Health Department and the City of Grand Rapids Housing Inspections uh, Division and Environmental Services Division. Um, Home, home remodelers and, and uh, uh, both private and non uh, both for profit and, and, and non profit, uh, as well as environmental uh, and social justice uh, agencies, organizations. Um, we sec have secured now uh, just under $15 million, $14.9 something million dollars in the last um, uh, successful in. I think it's three out of the last five rounds of uh, HUD funding for, for lead abatement. Um, the, uh, they've just, just abated the 800th uh, home, uh, uh, and we're gonna have a sort of a celebration on that. The, the data is showing that uh, through this program, which is more than just an abatement program, it's an education program and an awareness program, um, there's, an, there's a, an, an increasing line for um, uh, children being tested 
for lead and a, and a declining line for tested children who, who uh, evidence uh, lead poisoning. So it, it's beginning to have an impact. Uh, it, you know, there's a long way to go. Uh, there, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, suggests that in our metro area there are 35,000 uh, homes where children are at risk of uh, lead poisoning. Uh, and at the average cost of $16,000 to fully abate a, uh, a home, uh, the numbers add up r rather dramatically. Good, thank you. Uh, as is always the case, there's not enough time to talk about the, all the issues that we'd like to address. I, I want everybody to give a round of applause to our, our panel of leaders. Thank you. As, as a last comment, if you take nothing else from this panel, and obviously you can see the passion and the commitment of, of the leaders of these uh, governmental units, try and figure out from today's conference what it is that you can do to make a change. Uh, what it is that you can do in, in your daily lives as you deal with structural thought processes to say, what can we do to make sure that West Michigan is a best place to live, work, and play? We need to start running, guys because uh, we're not moving fast enough down the path. We got great foundation and we got great efforts that are going on as demonstrated by the, the words today from our community leaders. But I can encourage you, we got to get going faster. The good news that I'll leave you with, Ford Motor Corporation announced a $2.3 billion profit in the first quarter. The auto industry hopefully is back. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Please.